So we're going to start by talking about forms. Uh, so forms are the way that we provide user input uh, on our website. So anything the user needs to you know, type some input in, uh, provide some data, something like that, we'll use a form for. Um, so you know, like a search box or an order form, um, et cetera. Um, there are several types of form controls we have available to us uh, to provide different types of input. So we can have just you know, single line text input. We can also have like a password input or a text area. We've got different ways to provide choices. Um, then we've got our submission. Um, so the forms submit the information to a web server, um, and then the server processes that information and saves it or something. So all we're really doing here, again, is what we call the front end, uh, which is just sort of the input side of things. So we won't really, we'll deal, you know, when we get into JavaScript with maybe processing some of that data. Um, but in general, what we're doing here is we're just inputting data and then we're sending it to the server and letting them deal with, um, you know, processing it and doing whatever needs to get done. So <clears throat> we use a form element to wrap our entire form. Uh, so we start with an opening form and uh, end with a closing form after all of our elements. There's a required attribute of action, which provides the URL that the form submits its information to. So again, the form is sending that information somewhere else. Uh, it can be on the same, you know, website, or so it could even be just the same page if whatever, you know, page you're viewing, the server can also handle submission to that same URL. Um, but it's required to provide some sort of action. Um, we also have a, a method attribute, uh, which uh, can be one of two things. It can be either get or post. So get, again, we talked about as HTTP verb. Um, it's indicating that we're just requesting some sort of information. We're re requesting a resource. It can have some, you know, information with it. Like if it's a search query, we have a query string along with our search, uh, you know, with some text in it. So, but it's still just a get request. We're not expecting the server to save that query string or to like process it in some way. It's just an identifier of what information we want. Um, so again, you can have a, a form that uses get that may have one or two fields on it, but those are just you know, sort options or, or something like that. Um, and then post, we would use if we're actually sending data. So like an order form or a you know, contact box or something like that, where we're sending information to the server that it should then save or relay somewhere else or, or something like that. Um, we use input. Um, elements for multiple types of form control. So it's kind of a generic form input, and then we use the type attribute to determine the type of input that that is. Um, input's an empty element. There's no you know, contents that go within it, so it is self-closing. Um, the name attribute is pretty important, and it gives a unique name to that input um, that identifies it when it's sent to the server. So when the server gets a form input, what it's getting is key value pairs of the names of the inputs and then the values of those inputs. So the name attribute is how we uniquely identify that input. So um, it's how we tell the server, okay, this is the first name, uh, and then you know it gets the value of that input. Um, so a couple different types of text input. So first is just generic input type equals text. It will just be a single line box. Um, we can adjust the width of it and even the height um, with CSS, but it's just a one-line text box, so it's great for things like name, uh, stuff like that. Um, we also have an input type of password, which creates a password box. Um, all it really does is it obfuscates the input, um, you know, so when someone's sharing your screen and they're typing a password in, you can't actually see what the password is um, because it obfuscates it. Um, so that's really important to use a lot of cases, even like a, you know, credit card number or like a credit card security code will typically use password inputs. Um, so that someone looking over your shoulder can't read your credit card information that you typed in. Um, it's worth noting that you know password input doesn't really provide any other security other than that. So you still have to you know do different uh, things having to do with security to, to make sure that, that input is secure, make sure you're hashing it on the server side and saving it and stuff like that. Um, all it does is obfuscate the input. So there's no magic security added by just using that password input. Um, we can also do uh, radio buttons using input type equals radio. Um, we use the name attribute, again, to group multiple radio buttons together. So, um, you know, radio buttons usually are for some sort of list that you have choices and you can choose one from a list. So we, they will all have the same name attribute for a set of choices. 
Um, and then only one with the same name can be selected at a time. Um, then we use the value attribute to indicate the value sent to the server if that one is selected. So that's how we tell the server what the actual selected value is. There's also a checked attribute we can use to pre-select a radio button. So if there's a default option or if you want one of them to be selected when the page loads, you can use the checked attribute. And I'll show what that looks like. Um, so here's an example of using uh, radio input. So we've got three radio buttons. Um, they all have the same name. So this is like selecting your favorite genre of music or something like that. So uh, because they all have the same name, only one of them will be able to be selected. That's something the browser will implement. It won't let you select multiple one. Um, but they all have different values because they're all you know unique. Um, we'll still need some kind of label along with them as well. If we just had this HTML, you just see three radio buttons with no label. The value doesn't actually show up you know visually. Um, but again, whichever one is selected, along with the rest of your form data, you'll see genre equals pop, or whatever is selected is what the server will see. Um, this checked, this is how you do checked. Uh, technically, you can put whatever you want in this value. All that really matters is the attribute itself. Um, but uh, the, the best practice that is kind of settled on, what most people seem to do is do like check equals checked. Um, is just kind of the best way to do it. You can, some people do like check equals yes or check equals true or something like that. It works fine, but um, typically check equals checked is the best route to go. Um, we can also do check boxes. So check boxes will be used when there's uh, like more of a multiple choice where you can select multiple options. Um, so very similar to radio buttons in that we use the name attribute to group them together. Uh, so that's how we indicate that a set of checkboxes are all the same you know, option, all possible you know, answers to a question. Um, so however, unlike radio buttons, multiple checkboxes with the same name attribute can be selected. So you can select multiple options. And the server will get all of those options that you've selected. Um, and different server software handles it differently, like uh, PHP will combine them into an array. Um, you know, Java will kind of handle it a little bit differently. Sometimes they just, you know, have the multiple key value pairs in the, you know, response object. Just kind of depends. So some, sometimes you have to, you know, kind of worry about how you handle that on the server side. Um, the value attribute, like radio buttons, indicates what actual value is sent when that checkbox is checked. Um, so usually, like, if it's, sometimes you'll use a checkbox when there's just one option. Like if it's like a question, so like, do you want to receive our newsletter? You might have a checkbox and you just have the value be yes. Um, you know, because if the user selected that, then it's, you know, yes, they're opting in. Um, otherwise, if it's not checked, it won't be sent. And that's something important to keep in mind, especially once we're doing, you know, data side stuff, server side things, is that if you have a checkbox that isn't checked, it doesn't get, you know, the server doesn't see value opt-in equals no. They just don't see that data at all. Um, that option is not even uh, in the response object. So something to keep in mind. Uh, similar to radio buttons, we have the checked attribute we can use to pre-fill default options. So here's a checkbox example. Uh, this would be like a multiple choice of like what music service do you use? Um, so they all have the same name of music service. Um, they have different values, um, iTunes, Spotify, and Google Play. Um, and then you notice I have a label here after them as well. So, you know, I have actual text after the input with what that option indicates. Because again, the value doesn't actually show up visually, it's all behind the scenes. Um, one thing to, to point out too, I didn't necessarily do a good job with that here, but um, typically when you're sending data to the server, especially if there's, you know, defined set of options, Typically, we want the, those values to be what we call machine readable, or we want it to be easily used in variables and stuff. Um, so typically, you want it all lowercase. You don't want to have spaces. Um, you maybe use dashes or something like that. Um, so like, for instance, here, the value is just iTunes. But then in my text, you know, in my label, I can, you know, capitalize it or whatever. Here, this is not a good example. You probably don't want to do this because it's just a little bit harder to, to manage in the, on the server side. Um, again, you can do it, you, you can do whatever you want on the server side, but typically when you're dealing with server variables, you know, you want to keep them a little bit easier for the computer to read. 
Okay, drop down list. So um, you can use select uh, to create a drop down. And then you use option elements inside of the select to provide the options that they can choose from. Um, instead of checked, you do selected equals selected to uh, identify the default option if you want one of them to be pre-selected. I think typically if you don't do selected equals selected, the first option that will be selected says like choose one or something like that. Um, different browsers will handle a little bit differently though. Um, you can also allow multiple selections. You can do multiple equals multiple. It changes it from a drop down to more of like a select list where you can like hold command or control and select multiple options. So I don't really like doing that because I, I think it's confusing. Typically you use check boxes if there's like a multiple choice type thing. Um, but there are a few um, times when that's a good option to do. So here's an example of uh, doing a drop down. Uh, so we've got our select, uh, the name goes on the select, uh, so that's important. Um, and then the value goes on the options. Um, and in this case, we've said multiple is multiple, so they can select multiple ones. I'll show you what that looks like here in a little bit. But um, So we've got our select and then multiple options. They each have different values. Whichever value is selected is what will get sent up to the server. Questions so far? Yeah. Yeah, uh, so typically if it's an optional question, you know, then the user just doesn't have to select anything and it will just not send that to the server. Um, so that's a valid way of doing it. Yeah, so there's a required attribute. I'll show you that here in a little bit. Um, we'll talk about that, you know, a bit here in a, here in a little bit. Good, really good question though, um, but we'll get there. So another option is to do a file input. If you want the user to be able to upload a file, they're setting their profile image or adding an email attachment or something. Um, so input type equals file. Uh, the behavior is a little bit different in each browser. Most of them will have like a little box with the file name and then like a browse button. And then you can choose, it'll open a dialog and you can choose the file. Sometimes you can like drag the file straight to that input and it'll you know, select it there. Um, Important thing to note too though is that the server has to be configured to accept that file input along with your you know post request. So you can't just you know start sending you know files you know just to, to any you know request. It has to be configured to accept that file input. It's a little bit trickier because especially if there's you know servers like uh, like Apache, uh, which is a server um, software, will have like maximum file upload. Uh, Setting so like you could say you know no nothing bigger than ten gigabytes or ten megabytes can be uploaded to the server things like that so you start to have to start you know considering these types of things maybe you want to restrict the file type stuff like that um, so if you're using input file you need to make sure you're you know working with your server side to make sure uh, everything's configured correctly um, so then it comes the submit button so we use input type equals submit uh, to submit the form. Um, the name attribute is optional. You can use the name attribute if you're going to have multiple submit buttons. So sometimes you might have like a save and then like a save and new or something like that where there are multiple submit buttons that you want to do mostly the same thing but maybe the server behaves a little bit differently depending on which one the user has clicked. So you can use the name attribute to do that because the server does see the name of the submit button that was, that was clicked. Um, the value attribute provides the actual text that is displayed on the submit button. So by default, I think it usually just says submit if you don't provide a name or a value um, attribute. But you can do uh, like here, value equals send message, and then the button will say send message. Um, I, I don't like that. I, it's, it's different than the rest of form inputs where the value is a machine, you know, kind of a behind the scenes thing that the user doesn't see. In this case, it is something the user sees. So. I don't like the way that they've handled that, um, but that's the way it works. Um, another option is to use an image for your button. So if you want to do something fancy, if you want you know, a uh, button, you can style buttons uh, with CSS, and you can even do quite a bit of styling. 
let's say you've got an image that you want to use. Um, instead, you can use input type equals image uh, to replace the submit button with a custom image. Um, it uses the same attributes that the image tag does, so source. Um, and then you also do need to provide an alt tag um, or an alt attribute with your uh, image input. Because again, screen readers, you know, they'll just see this image, but they can't read the image with this text on it. So you provide an alt attribute uh, and say what that button does, what that image does. Another option is to use uh, hidden input. So you can use input type equals hidden, which will create form controls that are not shown on the page. Um, so there's various reasons that you might use this. Uh, typically, you're having to do with JavaScript. So maybe there's uh, a timestamp of when the form is submitted that you want to be sent to the server. Um, maybe there's some sort of calculated field, like a subtotal or a total. If it's like an order form, you might use JavaScript to calculate the total amount of the order and submit that to the server as well. Um, user ID, something like that. Um, a really important thing to keep in mind, though, is that that input can be seen uh, when you do view source, so you shouldn't put anything sensitive in there, even like security tokens and stuff you have to be careful about, um, because the user can actually see what those hidden inputs are. They won't show up on your page, but if you view source or do inspect um, and look at the inspector, you will see those. You can also change the value of them, uh, you know, just in your browser. I'll show you an example of that here in a little bit. So you have to be kind of careful. You know, for example, if you did a subtotal, uh, it's a real thing that's happened where you know a website will do that. They'll you know calculate the total amount of the order in the browser. They'll put a hidden input field where they you know add that that uh, the JavaScript writes the total to that input, and then the form submits. The server gets a list of items and it gets the total. Uh, you know, the total amount, and it uses that field to then charge the credit card. Well, in your browser, you can edit the value of these fields. So maybe you add your products, and then you go in and you change the value of that hidden total field to zero dollars. If the server trusts that input and just takes it as word, it's okay, zero dollars, it'll charge you zero dollars. That's actually happened. There's all kinds of uh, you know, websites that have run into problems with that. Um, so you have to be very careful. The general rule of thumb, you know, in web security is to not trust user input. Um, assume that your user input is bad and trying to rip you off somehow or trying to cause a problem. Um, so, for instance, you know, there are valid reasons to include a total as a hidden field. And, you know, maybe you use that somehow on the server to, you know, trigger different things. But you want to calculate it on the server as well before you actually. Uh, so don't just trust, you know, any of these hidden inputs as, you know, definite truth because they can be altered. So, for instance, you know, so like I'll, I'll use hidden inputs a lot, you know, to provide a user ID uh, in like an interface. So if there's an interface and the user's, you know, doing things, you know, I'll have a hidden input that provides the user ID so that on the server side, I know, okay, this is the user that's making the change. But I still do some validation to make sure I've checked it with the cookie or the session. Um, you know, I, it's, I'll use it as a convenience on the server side, but you still validate it. You still make sure because you could change the user ID and try and alter someone else's information. So you have to be really careful uh, how you use those. Um, so form labels. So uh, the labels are used to create a label for the form control, and we use a label element for that. Um, and it's really important to do this actually. You know, you could just have text or you could use like a paragraph or whatever and kind of position it next to the element and it will work. Visually, you'll see, okay, this says name and then here's a box to type my name. That makes sense. But using the label element really helps screen readers out. Um, and especially, there's two ways that we associate the label element with the input that it's related to. So it's really important to do that because the screen reader will read through the form and it needs to know what the label of that form input is. Um, there's also a few other ways that this comes into play. Sometimes if you like click on the label, some browsers will do this. If you click on the label, it will you know, put your, uh, your cursor inside the input for you so it's a little bit easier to deal with. Um, so there's two ways to associate the label with the input. The first is to put the input inside the label element. So it's a perfectly valid way to do it. So we've got our label, we've got our actual label text, first name, and then we have our input, and then we close our label. So the input is contained inside of the label. So that's one uh, valid way to do it. 
Another way um, that I think is preferable in most situations is to use a for attribute. So um, you use the for attribute and it corresponds to an ID attribute that you put on the input. We'll talk more about IDs uh, towards the end of the lecture, but we've got our label and we do for equals first name, and then that corresponds with this ID input of first name that we put on the input. So the reason I like this better is if you do it this way, um, you're a little bit restricted in the you know positioning that you can do because your input is a sub element of the label. So if you move the label somewhere, if you say, okay, I want to move my label 20 pixels to the left, the input's going to move as well because it's contained within that element. Um, so doing it this way kind of decouples them a little bit so you can move them independently a little bit easier. So I, I prefer to do it this way. Sometimes you might even have all of your labels and then all of your inputs. There's valid reasons to do that. Um, but if you use this method, it doesn't really matter where they're located in your HTML. The screen reader knows, okay, when I hit this input, here's how I find the label. And the screen reader will read it in a way that makes sense. Um, it's also you know, important to point out that your label location should you know, be pretty obvious which input it goes along with. Um, I've seen websites uh, that, for instance, a really bad choice is to put the label below the input. But I've seen that before where you know you have like an input and then the label or something. But the problem is, especially if you don't, you know, have a well-designed website, at some point with a long form, you can't tell anymore, you know, like, okay, well, does this label go with this input or this input? Who knows? Um, so, you know, some options are typically I like to do, you know, the label on top is kind of the best practice, um, and then the input. But then you want to space out your input a little bit so that it's really obvious which label goes with which, 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 with which input. You don't want them to just be all squished together. Here you have some separation to see, okay, cool, I know which one goes with which. You can also put it to the left if you want. Um, that's a fine uh, you know, pattern to do as well. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about some of those options when we get into uh, design principles. But you don't just, when you're designing your form, make sure you think about how the user is going to associate with them. You don't want it to be confusing. You want to prevent some users from making mistakes because uh, that's really annoying when you fill out a form and you miss, mess, miss something up. It's important. Okay, uh, there's some ways to group uh, form elements together. So if you have a long form that has multiple parts, uh, so for instance like a university application or something like that, you're going to have like a you know, personal info, you're going to have like a school history, you're going to have grades, you're going to have, you know, volunteer experience, whatever. These multiple sections that each have, can have multiple inputs within them. Uh, so we use field set to group multiple form controls together. Um, and then we use legend immediately after the opening field set to give the field set a caption, so to add a title to our field set. So here's kind of what it looks like. So we have our field set. Um, then we can have our legend, it says like contact me, and then we can have all of our inputs. Um, those inputs still have labels. Um, and all, again, all of this goes inside of our form element. I'll show you an example of what it looks like here in a little bit. There's some uh, newer form features with HTML5 that the browsers have added that uh, make things uh, a little bit more convenient. So uh, first is a required attribute. So this is going to, you know, the question you brought up a little bit. Um, we can now say required equals required on any input, and the browser will force the user to fill it out. Um, so usually it will, you know, if they skip it, it'll turn red or something. And if they try and submit the form and that, you know, value is not filled out, it will stop them from submitting the form and usually do a pop-up or something and say, oh, you can't do that, you need to fill out this field. Um, so that's super, super useful. Um, one thing to keep in mind, though, Again, going back to web security and not trusting user input, the user can remove this, uh, this attribute if they want. They can go into the inspector and they can just remove that attribute from the HTML and now they can submit the form without that, uh, that value. So you still want to validate it on the server side. If you know that, you know, if you don't have, you know, if you're creating a user object and you know that there's no email that's going to have, throw an error, make sure you check on your server side that all of the inputs that you really need exist, and if not, return an error message um, to the user. So 
Again, these are really convenient. They solve like 95% of the problems that users have with forms because it, you know, it prevents them from making a mistake. But for security reasons, you still have to make sure you validate um, you know, on, the, uh, on the server side. A uh, couple other examples of some of the things. We have a date input now. So input type equals date. Uh, this was a hugely helpful because it used to be you just had to use a text box um, and maybe tell the user what format to put the data in. There's all kinds of different date formats you can use. Different, you know, some countries put the you know month before the day or the day before the month. Uh, so you never quite know what that is. You don't know if they're using slashes or dashes. So it used to be a huge pain to deal with dates. Um, on forms, but now there's this date input, so the browsers will do a pop-up um, that kind of shows a calendar, and they can select the date uh, in that pop-up, and it'll pre-fill uh, the, uh, the field then. Um, older browsers will just use the text box, so if a browser doesn't support this uh, date type, um, <coughs> then it'll just show it as a text box. It's kind of nice, actually, that the older HTML specs, basically, if, the, if whatever's in the type is just not valid, it just uses the text box, so it's kind of a nice feature of older browsers. So now, you know, they've added these new features using these different types, and older browsers just ignore it and just show a text box. So it doesn't break anything um, to use these. It's just less convenient. We also have an email input type now, so it will ver verify a proper email address has been input. So if the user doesn't you know, use an at symbol and have a .com or whatever, um, it will reject their input. We also have a URL type, uh, which will, uh, you know, specify that it's URL. There's also a number input type as well now, um, or at least phone, I think, is one of them now as well. Um, and one really nice feature about these as well is that if you're on a mobile device, and you may have seen this, sometimes when you go to the input, it'll change the keyboard based on what the input type is. So if the, your mobile browser knows it's a number input, it'll show you a number dial pad instead of the full keyboard. Uh, which is kind of nice. Uh, same with like email, it'll usually now replace, it'll show like the at sign and like .com and .net or whatever um, kind of on your keyboard. So it makes it a little bit easier to put in your email. Also helps you with pre-fill. So if you use input type of email, if your browser knows, hey, this is an email address, I probably know what their email address is and it'll give you those pre-fill options. So again, really nice to do that. There's also a search input type. Um, that I don't really understand very much what it's for. Usually it has a clear button next to it, so if you type something in, it has a little X you can click and it clears out your input. Um, but only some browsers do that. Firefox, for instance, doesn't really do anything with the search input. So you might use it if you've got a search box, uh, and especially if you're doing some JavaScript to load results or something. It might be kind of handy, but um, it's not that, not that useful. Um, there's also a placeholder attribute now, which can be used to add background text in any text field. So, um, you know, we talked about text area. I think we talked about text area. Um, you know, any contents inside the text area are pre-filled, and the user has to delete them. Placeholder is better because it shows it just in the background. Once the user clicks into the field, the placeholder disappears. Uh, so they don't have to, like, select it and delete it. It's not going to be accidentally submitted. It's just kind of a background. So that's really nice. I'll show an example of that here in a minute. Oh, let's show an example now. So, here's an example of a form. So, So we've got our form element. That's the most important um, part, or the first part of our form. Uh, so it's got an action here. Just check out that PHP. So again, this action can be relative or absolute. Um, in this case, you know, it's just a different URL on the same web page. So if I'm on washu.edu, that would be washu.edu slash checkout.php. Um, and typically, your action is going to be some sort of server-side URL, something that's you know going to be handled by a programming language of some sort. It's usually not going to be an HTML page, right? Um, because the HTML page can't do anything with that input. Um, it has to be some sort of server-side uh, thing that's going to handle it. Um, 
in, unless you're using like uh, you know React along with like React Router or something, and you're using JavaScript to handle that routing. Uh, that would be the only exception there. Um, so then here's an example of what a field set looks like. So inside our form, we've got a field set element. Uh, it goes all the way down to here where we close it, and then we've got our legend, which is the first um, element inside the field set that provides a label. So here you can see the field set it just draws a box around all those inputs, um, and it kind of puts the label up here. Uh, and uh, it's kind of, I don't know, I think it's interesting how they chose to style that by default. Uh, but you can change it. You can move the label around. You can remove that border if you want. Um, it's still a nice way to, you know, break out the structure of your form. Um, so here's an example of a select box with multiple. Um, so this is a this is an example where I don't like to use uh, this multiple select because again, a lot of users don't understand that if you just hold control or command on a Mac, you know, you can select multiple ones or even shift if you want to like select all of them. Um, a lot of people, it's a little bit harder for users to use. Um, so I don't really like this option, but this is what it looks like. Um, and if it's long enough, you know, in here it'll scroll uh, with those options. But if we remove multiple, then it'll turn into just a normal dropdown. So now it's just a regular dropdown, you know, where the user can only select one. They can no longer select multiple. Um, they can only pick one option. Um, so really, this is an example, you know, this is where they're choosing, you know, the products they want to buy. This is kind of a better option for some checkboxes. So we will switch it to checkboxes. And we'll do uh, input type equals checkbox. Um, and then the value is going to be the same because the value here is uh, kind of the group, or not the value, the name is going to be the same. So we'll call it like product. Um, and then the value is unique to that checkbox. So the value is what that checkbox actually is indicating. In this case, it's choose. So then, um, and then we'll also close, and we'll get rid of this closing input. Technically, the browsers can handle if you put a closing input tag, um, but it's, it's not really valid. So I'm just going to paste this. Computer's running so slow. I think it's because I'm doing the YouTube streaming thing. Well, it appears to be frozen. Um, but this is how it's kind of going to show us. Uh, this is how we would do, you know, multiple checkboxes. They all have the same name. Uh, really, we need to change the value of this for sure. The value of this. Um, etc. <coughs> yeah, we're you know, which we're good. We might need to <clears throat> figure out a better option here. Oh, we're installing more updates. Okay. Got a few minutes here. We'll get as far as the first class did. I think we're going a little quicker um, this time. So let's talk about IDs and classes. So any element uh, can carry an ID attribute, uh, which is used to uniquely identify a specific element on the page. Um, so again, it uniquely identifies that specific element. So uh, IDs should be unique for each element. You shouldn't have multiple elements with the same ID. Uh, technically, it's not going to like break your page, but it may cause problems with your CSS or with your JavaScript, and it's not going to be valid HTML at that point if you have multiple elements with the same ID. Um, 
IDs have to start with a letter or an underscore. So they can't start with a number or a space or a special character of some sort. It's just the rules of HTML. Um, so yeah, the ID and attribute, the ID attribute is used by CSS and JavaScript to interact with that specific element. Um, you can also have multiple ID attributes um, or multiple ID attribute values. You separate them with a space. You can say like we've got a paragraph, we say ID equals introduction text and then space and ID2. So now both of those IDs are uniquely identifying that paragraph. Technically, you rarely need more than one ID because again, it should be unique, but there are a few cases where it makes sense to have multiple IDs. So again, you know, IDs don't do anything by themselves. You could add all kinds of ID attributes to all of your elements on your page. It doesn't really do anything by default. It's just a way of being able to identify that element when we get into CSS and JavaScript. So it really becomes very powerful and even necessary once we get into styling um, and dealing with interaction. So when we're dealing with React, you're going to deal with a lot of IDs because it's how React knows how to identify the elements on your page. Um, the class attribute is very, very similar. Um, except that it's used to identify several elements as being part of a group. So if you put class attributes, um, it's not uniquely identifying elements, but it's identifying a group of elements. Um, so for example, you might want to style some important paragraphs differently. Uh, maybe you want important paragraphs to be bold or something like that. You can give it a class of important. Uh, so P class equals important. Um, and you can put that on as many paragraphs as you want. And then you can say in your CSS, okay, any paragraph with class important, make it bold. You know, make those paragraphs bold. Um, you can even have multiple elements of different types that can all share the same class. So you can have important headings and important paragraphs. Um, and you can target them differently in your CSS if you want. So, uh, you know, when we get into CSS, we'll talk about how, how that works. Um, and some of the ideas, you can have multiple values for your class attribute and you just separate them with a space. And note here, you can even have classes and IDs as well. Uh, you know, you may need an element to be a part of a group and also to be uniquely identifiable. So it's perfectly valid to have uh, classes as well as IDs. Okay, so block and inline elements. So some elements always appear on a new line. Um, you probably noticed this, you know, paragraphs always appear on a new line. Um, those are block level elements because they always get a new line. Um, headings, you know, if you have two headings, they'll be on separate lines. Um, lists and list items, those are all block level elements. Um, some elements, however, continue on the same line. They continue in the flow of the text. Um, so these are inline elements. They just appear in line. They don't get a new line. Um, so things like links, uh, bold or emphasis, uh, images and inputs are all inline. Uh, so again, if you've got a paragraph of text and you want a couple words to be emphasized, you put the emphasis, you don't want them to get a new line, so they're inline elements. Um, inputs also, you know, so for example, if we look at our form here, um, the, you know, like these inputs, because they're inline, uh, as well as this text, that's why they, uh, you know, these are all next to each other, and these just kind of span. Uh, you know, the only reason name is here on a new line is because there's not room for it up here. Um, so this is one example of where, you know, it sometimes makes sense to use a break tag. Um, I added one there for the previous class. Um, but, you know, say we want a space here between email and password. So we've got our email. We could do a break tag here. Uh, which would break password down onto a new line. Um, so there's other ways to do that. You can you can make inline elements act like block level elements. I typically do that. I'll set my you know inputs to block level elements, and it changes the way it works. But by default, they're inline. So you might have to use break tags to get them down to a new line if that's what you want. Okay. Um, Divs are also really important to talk about. So divs um, are just a generic block level element. So divs don't have any sort of semantic meaning to them. Um, they don't have any kind of features built in. Uh, 
browser doesn't treat them, you know, doesn't do anything special. Uh, it's just a generic block level element. I think it stands for division or something like that. Um, so it's block level, so every div will get a new line. Uh, divs also by default take up the full width of the page, so you'll notice if you have divs, you know, nothing else can be to the left or the right unless you change the way it works. Um, they're not styled any differently otherwise, uh, they're just kind of generic. Um, the power with divs comes when you give it ID or class attributes that then we style with our CSS or um, do something with JavaScript. So um, divs are how we would do like a column layout. You know, we can have all of that content in a div, give that whole div a width of 33% or something. We want three columns. We use floats to make them float next to each other, things like that. So divs are kind of how we group groupings of elements together. Um, so it's usually a good idea to group sections of your page with uh, it's kind of a good way to you know, structurally separate different sections of your page. Um, really common, if you look, you know, like if we look at, uh, this is a different, if we look at like google.com, you'll see they have lots of divs. Um, you know, a pretty simple page, right? There's not that much going on here. Um, but if you look at their HTML, because they're Google, it's uh, very complex and mostly with lots and lots of divs. 